Good afternoon, everyone. It feels good to be back with you for the first time in a week, uh, which is a lifetime relative to the past seven or eight months at this point. Also welcoming you on Global Hand Washing Day, Judy uh, and Tina. Uh, I am joined, as I regularly am, by the woman to my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, another familiar face, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Thank you both for being here. To my far left, another guy who needs no introduction, the superintendent of the state police, Colonel Pat Callahan. And we are joined and honored to be joined and welcome him back, the president of the Board of Public Utilities, Joe Fiordaliso. Joe, great to have you. We also have Jared Maples, the director of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Joe is with us uh, because today I am signing an executive order extending the moratorium on utility shutoffs. Under this order, no household may have its electricity, gas service, or water service shut off for non-payment through March 15th, 2021. And if there is any customer whose service has been disconnected during the public health emergency, this order requires that their service be restored. Additionally, the moratorium against the disconnection of internet or voice services is being extended through November 15 generally. However, internet shutoffs will not be permitted in any household in which there are school-aged children who need internet connectivity for remote learning through March 15, 2021 as well. And before anyone has their internet or voice services disconnected, cable providers must offer a, at least a 12-month repayment plan that would allow consumers to pay back what they owe over equal installments. In other words, no one is to be shut off and receive a demand for a lump sum payment, and only a customer can ask for a shorter repayment schedule. I'll ask Joe in a few minutes to speak to our moratorium program, but our message to residents is clear. As this pandemic and its economic fallout continues, we will continue to have your back. And as the winter months get closer and closer, no one should fear losing the ability to heat their home. I am grateful, and I under, underline that, grateful to the utility companies who have worked with us thus far in a voluntary fashion, and I look forward to continued partnership and good faith in protecting our residents. Our utility providers are offering payment plans, and I encourage anyone who can start paying down their balances to do so, even if it's just a little bit each month. And if you're unable to pay at all, Work with your utility provider, the BPU, and the Department of Community Affairs to see if you qualify for a payment assistance program. And in a similar vein, we are also proud to announce an additional $15 million in utility assistance under the programs currently run by the Department of Community Affairs under the leadership of the one and only Sheila Oliver. This infusion will allow us to be in a strong position to help qualify families. I also want to thank my legislative partners, especially Senate President Steve Sweeney, Speaker Craig Coughlin, and Senator Teresa Ruiz for working with us to have this investment included in the new state budget. Also this morning, I signed an executive order that extended the due date for filing the 2019 corporate business tax annual return from October 15th to November 16th. At the start of the COVID pandemic, many filers applied for and received an extension until October 15th to file their federal tax returns. Allowing this extra month to file the so-called CBT or corporate business tax return, which requires federal tax information, is thus a reasonable step. Next, yesterday we announced the opening of New Jersey's new state-run health care exchange under the Affordable Care Act in advance of the open enrollment period beginning on November 1st. I'm especially proud that we are able to provide better access than ever before for residents to find an affordable health care plan that works for them and that works for their families. Our new exchange can be found online at getcovered.nj.gov. That's getcovered.nj.gov. Uh, as I mentioned, open enrollment will begin on Sunday, November 1st, not much going on that week, uh, and run through January 31st, 2021. Uh, by the way, that's double the period that we've had the past couple of years 
uh, based on decisions that were made by the Trump administration. Our state exchange is the only place where financial help is available to help purchase a plan, and this year more assistance is available than ever before. Importantly, under our new exchange, individuals eligible for subsidy assistance and premium tax credits will find the lowest net premiums since the passage of the Affordable Care Act more than a decade ago. For these individuals, the cost of health care is estimated to be $117 a month. That's a savings of nearly $50 a month from the current year and even $30 a month cheaper than a plan purchased six years ago in 2014. Throughout the past nearly three years, we have worked hard to improve access to quality, affordable health care and coverage, uh, and the past seven months have proven the importance of having health care, for sure. Our new exchange could not be coming online at a more important time. I urge anyone who needs an affordable health care plan to check out the options available at that website, getcovered.nj.gov, today so you could pick out a plan well in advance of the start of open enrollment on November 1st. And I want to thank especially Marlena, Marlena Caride at the Division of Banking and, and Insurance that's done an extraordinary job to she and her team to get us to this point is really a heck of an accomplishment. Hats off to them. Next, the Department of Labor this morning released the latest unemployment figures over the past week. Just over 29,000 New Jerseyans filed an initial claim for unemployment. This is an increase of roughly 5,500 from last week. Since the beginning of the public health emergency in March, more than 1.65 million New Jerseyans have sought unemployment benefits, with nearly 1.44 million of those qualifying for benefits. Roughly 96% of all who have been deemed eligible have received a payment, and that's a total of $16.5 billion, and the average worker has received nearly $12,000 in benefits. Commissioner Rob Sarah Angelo and his team continue their work to clear all eligible beneficiaries for the funds they deserve, and that includes their work to implement the new $300 per week FEMA Lost Wages Assistance Program to people whose unemployment is COVID-related, an estimated, by the way, 800,000 New Jersey workers. As it pertains to that program, the department is getting ready to distribute up to $1.5 billion and eligible claimants can expect to see this money as a lump sum in their bank accounts or on their debit cards early next week. Most recipients don't have to do anything more to receive their funds, and those who do have to take additional action have been notified by the email and text from the department with instructions. This is another great example of why we need more robust, sufficient federal funds. It's not just for state and local government. It's for folks who are unemployed, who need that bridge to a better future that we all know is coming. But right now, it's hard just for small businesses, for restaurants, uh, for hospitality. We, put a, we announced in Hillsborough in Somerset County the other day that we were putting out $100 million of new CRF money, especially in particular for small businesses. I'm proud of what we've done, but we can't do it alone. We need the federal government. They play an existential, unique role. Uh, they can print money. We can't. No American state can. We need them to continue to be there for a whole host of needs, and especially on this point for our folks who are unemployed. Switching gears, the deadline for residents to respond to the 2020 census is literally midnight tonight. This is our last chance for the next 10 years to make sure that every New Jerseyan is properly counted. We have seen increased participation this year with a statewide self-response rate, that's the folks who have gone on that website, of 69.3 percent. That's higher, by the way, than any of the previous three census counts going back to 1990, and that's good news. It's because so many of you have been working with the census enumerators in your communities. We are confident that more than 99 percent of New Jerseyans overall, either self-reporting or wor those working with enumerators, have been counted. But we cannot leave literally any stone unturned, and no New Jerseyan can be left behind. If you have a family member or a friend or a neighbor 
or a coworker who's not yet responded, tell them to go to that website, 2020census.gov, but it's got to be before midnight tonight to get counted. The census means so much for New Jersey. Our representation in Congress rides on a complete count, as does our ability to receive billions of dollars in federal funds for our public schools, our health care networks, our transportation and mass transit systems, our communities, and so much more. Again, this is literally the last call. Go to 2020census.gov. If not right now, at least before midnight tonight. If you aren't counted today, you won't count for another 10 years. Next, I want to reiterate the announcement made on Monday that under executive order, contact practices and competitions for sports which are designated by the Department of Health under Judy's leadership as so-called medium risk are now able to resume indoors. That includes hockey, basketball, and indoor track, among others. These activities will be held to the same strict health and safety protocols which have been in place for the outdoor sports, which have already resumed. And we recognize that more and more athletes are returning indoors, and we want to make sure they're able to do so safely and under the proper protections. It also bears repeating that any game which requires 25 or more people to be played, and that includes players, coaches, and officials, cannot have any spectators in attendance. But for many of our high school and college athletes and many adult rec league participants as well, it is game on, and I am pleased that we've been able to take this step. Judy, a quick audible here at the line of scrimmage. As we do every Thursday, we want to update folks on the in-school transmission realities, and Mahan will uh, get us to that. That's an eye chart, but let me just tell you, last week we were at 16 individual outbreaks covering 58 individuals. This week that number is 22 and covering 83 individuals. Uh, the, the counties with it, uh, three uh, separate uh, outbreaks are Bergen, Cape May, and Ocean. They have three apiece. Everyone else is either zero, one, or two. And I remind folks that, that that's 22 buildings out of over 3,000 of the buildings that we oversee, obviously overwhelmingly, most of them in public schools. We take every one of those cases deadly seriously. But Judy, I have to tell you, six weeks into the school year, to have 22 cases of known transmission covering 83 people is well within any reasonable expectation that we had. So keep up the great work, folks. The schools that either I've seen, Judy, Tina, or others have seen with our own eyes, the anecdotal evidence has been really impressive. And what's also happening is what we predicted. You're starting to see, as, 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 they, had, uh, as they had committed to, uh, the remote category is slowly but surely shifting over either to hybrid, in some cases to full-on in person, or in other cases to a combination. Uh, and that's what we expected to happen in October into November, and that is what is happening. Finally, on Tuesday, I had the opportunity to talk directly and privately with Dr. Bob Redfield, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Washington. We had a very thorough conversation about where we are currently, both here in New Jersey and nationally, and what we need to do to keep pushing back against this pandemic. And I'm, I'm going to, Judy, refer to this in the context of the conversation with Dr. Redfield, but it's a theme that you and I are both going to hit hard today. Uh, and my guess is we'll be hitting hard for the next many number of weeks to come. And one thing that we must be careful of are indoor gatherings, which are increasingly becoming the starting points for outbreaks. And sadly, we're seeing more and more family gatherings as the sparks for these outbreaks. Now is the time to start thinking about Thanksgiving and the broader holiday season, regardless of the holidays you celebrate. We do not want a Thanksgiving dinner to turn tragic because someone unwittingly exposed a large member, uh, a large number rather, of their family members to the coronavirus. We urge everyone to take stock of how many people you may be inviting to your Thanksgiving table. This is not the year to plan to visit out-of-state relatives or to invite them to New Jersey. And whether it is Thanksgiving or a family birthday or we had a discussion this morning about a baby shower, we urge you to not gather around the dining room table with anyone outside your immediate household. And if you do, 
to limit that reach to only a limited number of close relatives or friends with whom you've been th with throughout this pandemic and to move, if at all possible, your celebration outdoors, uh, maybe around a fire pit or a patio heater if you've been able to get one. As Dr. Redfield noted, both to me and in other reported statements, and this is consistent, Judy, with what we're seeing, while we are seeing more people being vigilant in public, as he calls it the public square, it is when you let your guard down in your own home that things can go awry. So again, start planning your holidays now and please plan for a smaller table this year so we can help ensure that you can once again gather at a larger one ne next year. And I mentioned this is a topic we're going to be addressing not only today, but my guess is in the weeks to come. And the way I think about it is where we can regulate, where we can enforce PAT compliance, we're largely, not entirely, but we're largely in good shape as a state. It's where we can't, where we can't get inside your house, uh, where we can't get inside of packed in congregate, um, multi-generational family living, especially. That's where we're seeing not all of the challenges, but that's where we're seeing the bulk of them. So with all that out of the way, let's turn to our overnight numbers. We're reporting an additional 973 positive test results. That's a statewide cumulative total since our first case on March 4th of 216,994. Looking at so-called hotspot areas of our state, Ocean, Bergen, and Essex counties all reported more than 100 cases today. Middlesex counties reporting 89. Hudson and Monmouth are both over 70 cases today. The statewide positivity rate for all tests recorded on October 11th was 4.35%. That is up. And the statewide rate of transmission today sits at 1.16. And that's been, frankly, bumping along inside of a range for 10 days to two weeks now. In our hospitals, as of 10 p.m. last night, 542 confirmed, 191 persons under investigation for a total of 733, of whom 178 in ICU, 60 required a ventilator. In each of these key metrics, total hospitalizations, patients in our ICUs, and ventilators in use, we are now seeing increases that have been carried for better than one week. There is only one way. We don't have a therapeutic yet. We don't have a vaccine yet. There's only one way to get these numbers back down to where they were only a few weeks ago, and that's by doing the basics, wearing a face mask, by social distancing, washing your hands frequently with soap and water. If you don't feel well, take yourself off the field. If you've been exposed to someone who's COVID positive, take yourself off the field, wait a few days, get tested. That's the basics. That's all we got, folks. As the weather cools, those numbers are not going to change themselves. Only we can change the, those numbers. And that brings us to another number. Today, with a heavy heart, we're reporting an additional six fatalities due to COVID-19 complications. Our statewide cumulative total of Lost brothers and sisters is now 14,408 confirmed and another 1,789 probable deaths. Again, Judy, as we always say, at the risk of mixing apples and oranges, I've got seven deaths reported in our hospitals yesterday. But again, those are not in those confirmed numbers. With that, let's take a couple minutes and remember a few of those precious lives we've lost. This is a tough one. We begin today by remembering veteran Newark police officer Marcus Thomas, who proudly served his home city for nearly three decades, and Marcus was just 50 years old. Officer Thomas joined the Newark Police Department in May of 1993, serving in a variety of ways over the past 27 years, in central communications, on the Safe City Task Force, in neighborhood enforcement, and in the Office of Professional Standards. In mourning his loss, Mayor Raz Baraka put it simply, and I quote the mayor, the city of Newark has lost a truly good man who was a friend and brother to all. Marcus leaves behind his wife Kelly, with whom I had the great honor of speaking on Sunday, and you can imagine that was not easy for her. And there his daughters Kazmir and Mayel and son Jason. He's also survived by his parents, Ernest and Christine, and his siblings, Daryl, Cheryl, Hernandez, Katrina, Jamila and Bridget, among many other family and friends. And of course, he leaves his Newark police family, 
Officer Thomas was the sixth member of the Newark Police Department lost to this pandemic. We thank him for his service to the community he loved, and may God bless him, watch over him and his loved ones. Next up, we recall John Henderson of ATCO in Camden County. John was a proud Air Force veteran who served in Germany and Spain before continuing his career at the Frankfurt Arsenal in Philadelphia. He also worked for the IRS and later was a security guard. John never married nor had children, but he always remained close with his four younger sisters, and he had a knack of being able to make friends everywhere he went. Many of those friends would join John on an adventure now and then, including a trip to the Grand Canyon. He was a member of the VFW Pine Hill Post number 286 and Blackwood Post number 7927. He was a mainstay on the racquetball courts of the Pomona Golf Club. He loved the Eagles and Phillies and would take his 12 nieces and nephews to games whenever he could. John leaves behind his sisters Marie, and I had the great honor of speaking with Marie at the end of last week, Bernadette, Cecilia, Veronica, and their spouses, along with the 12 nephews and nieces that he loved as his own. And John was 72 years old. We thank John for his service to our nation. May God bless his memory and watch over him and all those who remember him. Finally today, we remember West Orange's Melvin uh, I was going to say Askenaze, which is the pronunciation I'm used to, but a family member, correct me, Askenaze, Melvin Askenaze, who was 97 years old. That's Melvin down front. He would tell you he was born on October 14th, the same day as his granddaughter, Julia. During World War II, Mel was a member of the 855th Bombardment Group of the United States Air Force. And yes, another Air Force veteran today earning the Distinguished Flying Cross for his bravery and service to our country. When the war was over, he enrolled at New York University and put the leadership skills he learned in the military to a new use, becoming president of his class on his way to receiving his degree in commerce and finance. Mel was also called back to serve in the Korean War in 1951. The confidence he gained through his service also gave him the self-assurance to approach one of his classmates, Selma Krasna, and ask her out on a date. They married on March 6, 1949, the start of what would be 46 years of marriage before her passing. Together, Mel and Selma would raise three children, and they are right there behind them, travel the world and spend countless hours dancing and laughing. Mel was also renowned for his ability to spin a good yarn and would relish the opportunity to tell stories from his war days or elsewhere from his life to his family and friends. Although there could be some question to which parts were real and which sprung from his imagination. It didn't matter. His nephew by marriage, Mark Levinson, a dear friend who chairs our New Jersey Israel Commission, described Mel as sunny, optimistic, and the word best was a big part of his vocabulary. It was the best dinner he ever had, the best sandwich he had. It was the best day that he'd ever lived. May leaves behind, Mel leaves behind his and Selma's children, and you can see them there, sons Richard and Alan, and daughter Bonnie, with whom I had the great honor of speaking at the end of the week, and their spouses, along with his five beloved grandchildren, David, Joel, Michael, Sidney, and Julia, with whom he would have celebrated a birthday yesterday, which would have been Mel's 98th, and his two great-grandchildren, Mason and Cole. A life well-lived and worth remembering and celebrating Thank you for your service, Mel, to our nation and for all you did throughout your life. May God bless you and may your memory be a blessing to all. Switching gears, let's take a moment to highlight another of the small businesses partnering with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to ensure a stronger and more prosperous future as we look forward to our eventual emergence from this pandemic. Today, we're heading to Morristown, home of the Gregory Legal Group where Paul Gregory, there's Paul on the left, and his team work almost exclusively in providing a full suite of legal services to small and medium-sized family-owned businesses. When the pandemic hit, many of the deals and projects that Paul and his team were working on with their clients were either canceled or postponed, and business fell by roughly 35%. 
To protect his business and employees, Paul reached out to the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to secure a small business loan that is helping him cover expenses as his business begins to recover. I had the opportunity to speak with Paul at the end of the week, and we share an optimistic view of our future, both for our state and for his business, and I know together we'll get there. By the way, check them out, gregorylegalgroup.com, gregorylegalgroup.com. A couple of quick other audibles. Yesterday I had a great visit to Atlantic City, my second, uh, in four or five days. Uh, we broke ground on a big, new, important project for Stockton University, yet another uh, uh, project for Stockton in Atlantic City. And we all know what happens when higher education is in your town. It leads to great things, and that is a great example of it. We also had a very good meeting with casino leadership and labor, uh, talking about uh, the struggles they've had, obviously, and how we can work together on steps going forward. I also want to say today we broadcast on Facebook Live a great discussion with our CEO council, which sprung out of our Restart and Recovery Commission. Um, the commission is chaired by Shirley Tillman, former president of Princeton, and Ken Frazier, CEO of Merck. The council is co-chaired by Ken and Charlie Lowry, the CEO of Prudential. We had a bunch of other CEOs on, and collectively that CEO council committed to 30,000 incremental hires by the end of the decade, and not just hiring them, but work developing and upskilling them with a particular focus on communities of color and underserved communities, and by mid decade, an additional $250 million from diverse suppliers, all from New Jersey, the hires as well as the suppliers. And if that weren't good enough, they then challenged the rest of the corporate community to come up with an additional 40,000 hires by the end of the decade from diverse and underserved communities and an additional $250 million from diverse suppliers by mid-decade. And by the way, I've spoken to a, not only the group and the council, but also to some of the other folks who are going to get there, and I have full confidence that we'll achieve all of the above. There's no reason why any other state in America can't do what we announced today, and it's a real public-private partnership. The state's programs, including ones we already have, as well as innovative new ones we'll need, plus the efforts underway already by these corporate citizens, I can't say enough about them and their leadership. There's no reason any other state hasn't done this, but they haven't. New Jersey's done it. So not only is this a game changer for our state, but God willing, it can be a model for other states to follow and the country can benefit from it as well. And finally for today, and this one is a tough one, I want to quickly note the passing of a tremendous young man from New Jersey, Chase Miola, who was senselessly murdered in an act of gun violence near the campus of The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where he was a senior preparing to receive his degree in marketing. Chase was a native of Mawa, and back home, Chase was a standout on the football field for the Mawa Thunderbirds. Our New Jersey family reaches across the nation and around the globe, with proud New Jerseyans literally in every state and territory and every country in the world. And I know Chase loved his hometown, and it loved him back. We send our condolences, deepest condolences, to his family, starting with his parents, Paul and Margaret, and I had a conversation with Paul the other day, and you can only imagine the heartbreak that they're going through, as well as to Chase's two brothers. It's an awful, awful, awful tragedy. A GoFundMe page in Chase's honor has been established, and his parents said that all proceeds will go to endowing, endowing a memorial scholarship. In that way, his life will be remembered, and the opportunity he never saw come to fruition, his graduation will be passed on for others to fulfill. God love that guy and his family. That is where we will end today. Judy, before we bring up you up to bat, do you mind if I go to my left here? We'll hear from Joe first. Please help me welcome the president of the Board of Public Utilities. Welcome him back, I should say, Joe Fiordaliso. Joe, thank you. Thank you, Governor, and it's good to be here with you. And uh, initially, you described what you're going to be doing this afternoon extremely well. And I just want to add that I talk to my colleagues, fellow commissioners throughout the country, and what we're doing here in New Jersey. Other states in our country don't even come close. So I, I personally want to thank you, uh, Governor, for your leadership in, in guiding us through this, and not only guiding us through it, but ensuring the fact that we take care of our fellow New Jerseyans. 
And this is part of what the extension of the shut-off moratorium is all about. Uh, one of the ways that we have tried to ease the situation for residents who are struggling, and the, the national numbers of unemployment rose again this past week, and close to 900,000 Americans filed for initial unemployment claims. Here in New Jersey, we have been working with the utilities to shut off, uh, to not shut off, put a moratorium on shut offs of essential services, supplemented by prior executive orders impacting cable. The utilities had a voluntary, had voluntarily agreed not to discontinue service like heat, gas, electricity, and water through today, October 15th. And as the governor mentioned, this is being extended uh, across the board for our residential, uh, for the residential customers until March 15th. And March 15th actually uh, commemorates the end of the winter season moratorium that the heating companies abide by every single year. So this helps get people through this very difficult time. I do want to mention uh, that utilities have been extremely cooperative. Most of our utilities here in the state of New Jersey just stepped right up to the plate. And I talk to the CEOs of these utilities almost on a daily basis. And most of them stepped right up to the plate and said, whatever you and the state of New Jersey and the governor need, we're there to help. So I think I'd ask you to keep that in mind um, as we go through this, that there are good corporate citizens. Some do push back, I have to be honest. But with this executive order, they're all, all going to have to comply um, with the no shutoff moratorium that's going to continue. I do ask, though, that each resident, each uh, utility customer, please reach out to your utility. Reach out to your utility in order to set up a payment plan. These moratoriums are, are, are not free. Eventually, one has to pay their bill. So it's incumbent upon you, I would suggest, that you reach out to your utility, you reach out to them, set up a payment plan, so that at the end of the moratorium, you're not faced with such a gigantic bill that it becomes overwhelming. The utilities are willing to work with you in order to set up this payment plan. I don't want to see anyone caught in a position where they drown underwater because they can't pay that bill or start paying off that bill. So please, if you have any questions, our phones at the Board of Public Utilities are open available to assist you if you can't get in touch with your utility. But I know that they're anxiously awaiting to hear from you so that we can proceed in an orderly fashion to start reducing the uh, debt that you have to them. And so someday these moratoriums are going to end. And I don't want any of our citizens, I know the governor doesn't, to be caught short. So plan now. And again, as I said in the beginning, there are very few states in the union that are doing what we're doing here in the state of New Jersey. Also, utilize the assistance programs that are available to you if your finances dictate that you need that help. And I know there are many, many people who are experiencing unemployment maybe for the first time because of this pandemic. Don't hesitate. 
Reach out to the Board of Public Utilities. Reach out to the Department of Community Affairs. There are programs like USF, LIHEAP, which are available to assist you. Just remember, you're not in this alone. We're here together. And together, we will eventually get through this. Thank you, Governor. Joe, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, thanks for your leadership. Um, I echo your point, uh, overwhelmingly outstanding corporate citizenship, whether it's in the utility space, whether it's in that CEO council I mentioned. Um, overwhelmingly, folks realize we've got to find common ground and we're all in this together. And I echo the point you've just made, which I alluded to in my remarks. Folks, get, get a plan organized, even if it's a small chunk, so that you don't face a tidal wave at some point down the road. As you, as you rightfully point out, this is not going to go on forever. So anticipate that. Again, Joe, thanks for your leadership. Uh, with that, please help me welcome the woman to my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Judy. Thank you, Governor, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, this week, the CDC shared that small gatherings are an increasing source of spread of COVID-19. As the governor shared, the CDC Director Redfield observed that when individuals are out in public, they appear to be more stringent in following precautions such as masking and social distancing than during household gatherings. Last week, the CDC, CDC released a study of a family gathering where an extended family members stayed in a house together for several weeks that led to an outbreak. One adolescent with COVID-19 spread the virus to 11 other family members, including her mother, father, and grandparents. This outbreak reminds us that even when we are with family members, we must adhere to public health guidelines to keep our loved ones safe. There are several factors that contribute to the risk of getting infected or infecting others with the virus that causes COVID-19 at a gathering. Higher levels of COVID-19 cases and community spread in the gathering location, as well as where attendees are coming from, increase the risk of infection and spread among attendees. Consider hosting activities with only people from your local area as much as possible. Indoor gatherings pose more risk than outdoor gatherings. Host outdoor activities rather than indoor activities as much as possible. Gatherings that last longer pose more risk than shorter gatherings. Adherence to preventive measures uh, influence risk. Individuals should stay at least six feet apart, wear masks, practice frequent hand washing. Provide or encourage attendees to bring supplies to help you and others stay healthy. For example, extra masks and hand sanitizer. Gatherings with more people pose more risk than gatherings with fewer individuals. Limit the number of attendees as much as possible. But remember, small gatherings can also be a problem. Being cautious when you interact with others is particularly important as New Jersey is seeing increasing signs of community spread in the state. The COVID activity uh, act, uh, map that you can see on the screen looks at case rates, the daily new COVID cases per 100,000 people per region. It looks at the percentages of COVID-like illnesses, which is defined as fever and cough or dyspnea, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or the presence of coronavirus diagnosis codes and the percent positivity. As you can see from the timeline at the top uh, of the screen, during March 28th through April 25th, we were in very high activity marked as red on the map. This was during our surge. This is the first time the entire state has been in the yellow zone. We do not want to see the red zone again in our state, but that depends on all of you, on personal accountability to take proper precautions to limit the spread, social distancing, wearing a face covering, washing hands frequently, and staying home when you're sick. 
we are seeing increasing case rates in all regions. Percentage of COVID-like illness is up in every region except the Southeast. There are increases in percent positivity in the Central East, the Southwest, and the Southeast. This slide shows the factors that go into classifying activity levels in the regions and is posted on our website. Moving on to my daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 733 hospitalizations of COVID-19 positive patients and persons under investigations. A short six weeks ago, that was barely 300. There are 178 individuals in critical care, 34% of the critical care patients are on ventilators. We are reporting one new uh, case of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. There are now 59 cases in our state. Thankfully, in New Jersey, there are no deaths reported at this time. The percent positivity uh, total for the state is 4.35%. The northern part of the state reports 4.45%. The central part of the state, 4.28% and the southern part of the state, 4.28%. At the state veterans' homes, there are a total of 393 cases among our residents, 146 deaths uh, among our residents, and that's a cumulative count. At our state psychiatric hospitals, cumulatively, there are a total of 223 cases and 13 patient deaths. Yesterday, we surpassed the 4 million mark on tests performed in the state. This concludes my daily report. Stay safe and remember, for each other, for us all, please take the call and download the app, COVID Alert NJ. Thank you. Judy, thank you for that. And thank you for going through the regional analysis. One thing that strikes me is when you go through the regional spot positivity and you compare it to the statewide, it's all in a very tight range, yeah. Tina, right? Yeah. What that tells us, I think, uh, is that, yeah, there may be hot spots here or there, but we're dealing with a statewide reality right now. Uh, and then secondly, to underscore the point that both you and I have made, and Pat, you're part of this, where we can enforce compliance, when we can monitor, um, when we can regulate, we're not batting a thousand, but we're batting a pretty high rate right now. It's where we can't. That is our challenge, right? It's the multi-generational packed in. It's the family gathering. To some extent, it's probably off-campus housing still, as we've seen at places like Monmouth University and others of late. Um, and that's got to change. That has got to change because the virus ain't going to change. What we do has got to change. Thank you for everything. Pat, over to you. Compliance, um, how's our, our fire brigade doing? Any other matters of, of note? Thank you for everything. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, with regards to compliance in the past week, there was uh, just one cited and reported to The Rock, and that was Najum's Lounge in Newark. Uh, police responded to the uh, a shooting actually there, and the uh, establishment was well beyond the 25% capacity. With regards to our forest fire service, uh, they are, as of about a half hour ago, in Ohio, and uh, if all goes as planned, they'll probably be back home safely in New Jersey by around midnight tonight, so a long, full four-day trek across the country. And if I can, just, uh, just to echo both yours and Judy's remarks about the social gatherings, I think uh, one, one thing Dr. Burke said last week that resonated with all of us was uh, that people struggle with believing that their family and friends can give them this virus. And it was just a, it was a good point. Uh, and I think I just, uh, I was reminded of it as I sat here when we talk about those family gatherings and that struggling to believe that your loved one can give it to you, I, th I think uh, is a valid reminder, especially what we're seeing throughout the state and country. Thanks, Gov. Amen, Pat. Please, God, no family has to go through this. But remember, Judy, the Fusco family early on um, that were devastated absolutely devastated following a family gathering. An innocent, nobody knew that they were, um, no one was symptomatic, no one knew that they may have been carrying the virus, and there were, at least, I believe, five deaths from that one family gathering uh, alone. So amen to that. 
and welcome back to our, God willing, by midnight tonight. When you said they were in Ohio, I thought, please, God, they're not fighting fires in Ohio, uh, but they're in transit, uh, and please, God, they'll get back safe and sound by tonight. Um, so we'll start over here. Before we go to Dustin, a um, couple of things. Uh, we will be virtual tomorrow unless we think there's a reason to be otherwise as well as Saturday, Sunday. This is an unusual week because of a Monday holiday. Unless Mahan tells me otherwise, we'll go back to a Monday, Thursday uh, format for next week. Um, and I also want to say we've been joined by Matt Platkin. And I, that's notable for a number of reasons, including that this is, la is his last, unless we change our format for tomorrow, this is your last press conference. And Matt, thank you for not just your help in these press conferences, but for your extraordinary service over the past two and three quarters years and for the many years you and I knew each other beforehand. And the good news is we'll still know each other when we wake up on Monday morning. So thank you, pal, for everything. Dustin, over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you have any update on whether or when fans will be able to attend football games at MetLife Stadium? Um, you said the other day that you've determined that the Bedminster event from a couple weeks ago didn't cause any outbreaks. What about EO violations? If not, what's the cause for the delay? Um, the Patterson School District approved a resolution last night to extend remote learning until at least January, uh, uh, mid-January next year. Will the state education department allow districts that started the year entirely remote to extend that into 2021? Dustin, which school district, sorry? Patterson. Patterson, okay. Um, and this is probably most fitting for the health commissioner or Dr. Tan. Do you have some specific examples of clusters or um, micro hotspots that the DOH has investigated in addition to places like Lakewood and Rowan? And do you have a comparison of the average age of new cases and deaths in the recent wave compared to earlier? Thanks. Thank you. Um, may I try to uh, answer a couple of these, Judy and Tina, and then throw it to you? Nothing new on fans at MetLife. Um, so there's nothing to report there. On Bedminster, actually, I, I raised this. I should, should have said this earlier. A very constructive conversation with Dr. Redfield, but I did reiterate, and I, we had the sense that the CDC, Judy, you heard this as well, had wanted to play a more robust role in contact tracing after the Bedminster event, but they were unable to. Uh, I raised that with him just to make sure on the record that we could have used their help. And I, as of this moment, I, I didn't ask you this an hour ago, but we, we're not aware of any outbreaks that are related to it. As it relates to EO violations, that's a matter, unless Matt tells me otherwise, for the Attorney General. Um, I don't want to speak for Kevin Deemer and his team, and obviously Judy has input on this. I think if the extension is warranted, we have to uh, consider it. Uh, Matt, you may want to weigh in on that, but if there's, for instance, if I, I don't know the Patterson specific, uh, and so if I, if I, having looked at that and reconsider that, I may come back to you or we may come back to you, but if, for instance, it was a ventilation matter and it still is not cured because not all, all the work has been done, you know, if it's a legitimate reason, I think we have to be open to extensions. But again, there has to be a legitimate reason, a plan, including what we can do to help, and then a date that is reasonable to achieve. Um, we are clearly seeing what we thought we would see. I mentioned this earlier, migration beginning from all remote to hybrid. I think the, the migration from hybrid to full on is going to be a lot slower and a lot less. You, you okay with that? Um, and Judy and Tina, over to you. Any other color clusters? We've spoken about Lakewood and including a couple of other surrounding communities in Ocean higher education as clusters. I mentioned Monmouth University, which is a big reason why the West Long Branch numbers are uh, where they are in terms of positivity. Um, in age, I think you asked on age and other demographics. I think we've said, but we, if we haven't, we should say, uh, and I think this is a sense that we're getting from our healthcare providers, and it's a national trend. It's gotten younger over, over the course of this uh, past seven plus months. Anything, Tina, you want to add to that? That's right. So um, at least in terms of looking at the cases and how they've 
changed and shifted uh, since the beginning of the outbreak to the present. Um, you know, definitely we are seeing uh, more cases occurring among the younger age groups, so uh, below 50, uh, you know, as, as one uh, um, example. And, you know, we have to remember that, you know, as we've been monitoring, um, you know, these cases throughout time, and as we continue to hear from our local health departments about outbreaks that are occurring throughout the state, you know, there, there are a lot of expected um, clusters that we're seeing. We're seeing small clusters associated with the schools, as mentioned earlier. We're seeing small clusters still occurring with long-term care facilities, still occurring among um, workplaces, still occurring among um, various um, small gatherings as well. So this you know, we're not surprised because of the reopening efforts, but at the same time, it's just a reminder that, you know, we have to continue to stay vigilant. But it's also good to know that the numbers in each of these clusters, they tend to be smaller than what we used to see early on, which also demonstrates, for example, in the long-term care setting, that um, there's more of awareness, there's more um, vigilance to making sure that a lot of infection control uh, measures and other preventive measures are taken early on to really prevent things from becoming worse than they uh, should be. Forgive me for you. I'd like to jump on with two additional points. A baseball terminology. There have been some big realities, and again, I will say that our working relationship with elected leaders, faith leaders, and others in and around Lakewood has been outstanding, but there's no escaping the fact that that's been a hot spot. Judy and Tina have plussed in uh, big time testing and tracing into those communities, higher ed. But for the most part, Tina, I'll use baseball terms, forgive me, this is a bunch of singles and doubles, small ball stuff that's a little bit here, a little bit there. It's kind of a, uh, uh, is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, that, that would be fair to say. Of course, we have seen larger um, you yeah, know, circumstances. Absolutely. But for the most part, they're you know, kind of these small singles and doubles. Of singles and doubles. I'm appealing to your baseball, the baseball <laughs> side of your life. The other point is to remind, and this is, I guess, a blessing, Tony Fauci reminded us, Judy, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, even if the numbers do go up and we get a second wave, whatever that might look like, we enter that, we did enter this period in a very strong position. So the numbers are going up. Someone reminded me today, uh, it may have been you, that Iowa is at a 20% spot positivity right now. North Dakota, you and I talked about the other day, they're out of beds uh, please, we pray for everybody in all, all those places. We entered into this, what feels like a, a, a wave or a surge in a very strong position, and uh, that's, a, that's a good thing, thank God. So thank you for that. Brent, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, what data shows that a close contact sport like wrestling is now allowed, but restaurants are still restricted to 25%? Um, when will you release an updated directive on indoor visits to nursing homes? The federal government is more lenient than New Jersey is on that. How many tests are being conducted each day in Ocean County? Uh, could we get a positivity rate every day like we get the rate of transmission uh, to give a better sense of how bad these outbreaks are? Hold on one um, second. Um, Ocean County testing, and then what, you mean even electronically? Yeah, on, on the COVID, da like we now have a rate of transmission on the dashboard. Is it possible to get um, positivity rate? Yeah, yeah um, yes, right. And then uh, for, the, for the BPU commissioner, um, were there any utility companies that previously didn't voluntarily agree? Um, and this one's from Dan Munoz. Um, has the state qualified for its own travel advisory, and have the governors of Connecticut and in New York mentioned they might consider restricting New Jerseyans' travel? And what would your reaction be if New York, Connecticut, or Pennsylvania levied the 14-day quarantine against New Jersey? Listen, I, with all due respect to Daniel's question, there are states right now that restrict travel from folks from New, Jer New Jersey. I got a fair amount of relatives still in Massachusetts. They restrict travel from New Jersey. Um, the, the, the punchline for me is not the, the, that premise for Daniel, wherever he is. I know he was on a virtual event earlier today. It's, frankly, the conclusion I draw is don't travel. Don't travel unless you have to, uh, particularly right now. Um, and we're going to do everything we can. We're not, we're not going to spend a lot of time complaining about whether or not we're on somebody's other list. We're going to spend all our time working to get our numbers down. Uh, and so I jumped to that one uh, ahead. Listen, on indoor dining, uh, um, uh, Judy can comment on, on the indoor sport reality, but the fact of the matter is we continue to be in the position we don't believe, we don't have any evidence 
that there are outbreaks coming from indoor dining, indoor gyms, indoor entertainment, and in particular in indoor dining, as you can imagine, with the casino uh, leadership yesterday, that was a, a, a topic of discussion. Uh, and, and unless Judy tells me otherwise, that's something we're going to get to sooner than later. I know I've said that before, uh, but that's coming to a boil. We think that responsibly, uh, unless something, unless the roof falls in us over the next number of days, we're going to be able to get to a, 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 more, a broader capacity there. Judy, I'll leave. Um, I, I'll jump to spot positivity. I see no reason why we couldn't put that on the dashboard every day. We know it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see any reason not to. So unless we come back to you and tell you otherwise, uh, Mahan, if you could help us out there. Judy, indoor visits on nursing to nursing homes. We know we're stricter than, than the federal guidelines. So that we, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And on how much testing is going on in OSHA. I know we've got gobs of testing statewide right now, but uh, any comments on that? Yeah, I don't have the actual number. I can get that for you um, because we monitor that every day. We have about four or five sites right now active uh, in and around Ocean, uh, primarily in Lakewood. Um, visits to nursing yeah, homes. The visits to nursing homes, there's a, we have another meeting today. Uh, we are going to be a little bit more restrictive uh, because we still have 150 active outbreaks in our nursing homes. Uh, as uh, Dr. Tan uh, shared, uh, although they're smaller, we're catching them uh, more quickly and mitigating and stopping the spread, uh, we, we still believe we have to be uh, very vigilant because of the wide scale spread throughout uh, the state, with the state all being in what we call the yellow zone. Uh, that just uh, reminds us that there's, there's wide scale community spread. Uh, so we're, we're going to be a little bit more careful. And we also um, have um, revised the directive to include the antigen testing. So it came, there's a couple things that we're trying to put uh, with one revision. Hopefully we'll get that out soon. Judy, we've said this lately more to schools for obvious it's back to school season and thank God we're not in the meltdown that we had in so many long-term care facilities around the state, frankly, around the country and around the world. But it's important to underscore, which is your point about being yellow, it, it, it matters what's going on inside the building, but it also matters what's going on outside Absolutely. the building, right? Those are not the community. disconnected. The community uh, reality matters here. Joe, um, any comment on that? Not to put anybody on the spot, but any comment on uh, Brent's question about anybody not going along with us? Uh, yes, and, and I won't put anybody on the spot, certainly. Uh, but yes, there, there was pushback, to answer your question, uh, from some uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the primary reasons was that some of those who did push back a bit uh, answered to a mother company that is outside of the state of New Jersey. And uh, they had to justify uh, to higher ups uh, the reasons and, and, and so on and uh, were actually encouraging uh, stronger action by the state uh, so that they could sell it to their mother companies. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Brent. Sir, do you have any? Yep. Give us one sec. A couple for you, Governor. Uh, first off, um, on the ACA, uh, if it is overturned by the Supreme Court in the future, what would New Jersey stand to lose in federal health care subsidies, and what would the impact be on the state's budget and on residents? And following on that, how do you ensure that the state subsidy lasts beyond a Murphy administration? A couple others. First off, how many people have voted by mail thus far, and how do you think the process is working? And lastly, the number of MVC agencies forced to close because of workers getting COVID keeps going up. Eleven agencies have lost a combined 100 workdays due to COVID closures. What more can your administration do to protect and test agency workers so the MVC can keep all its locations open? All good questions. On ACA, I mean, health care is front and center in this big Supreme Court battle. There's no getting around that. Uh, I, I, this is not my job, but I will just say the overwhelming amount of Americans, never mind New Jerseyans, um, want uh, the Senate and the Congress to be focused on the next stimulus desperately needed stimulus and not on jamming this uh, 
nomination and confirmation through. Uh, so I got to get that off my chest. I don't know what the numbers are in terms of dollars, but it would be devastating, depending on what it looked like, devastating for our state, devastating for every state. Pre-existing conditions, Matt, uh, I believe in the millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of seniors would lose access to medication, uh, women to contraception and other health care, uh, kids up to, the, to their mid-20s who can now stay on their parents' um, uh, health care plans. It is a complete meltdown. The Affordable Care Act, there's, a, there's this myth spinning out there that there's something wrong with This has been a game changer. Never mind the, the employment that has come from it. Uh, this has allowed states, uh, allowed residents to get access to health care that they never had before, or in, some, in many cases to afford it at a level they could not before. And New Jersey has led the nation, witness setting up our own exchange, witness that new subsidy that we're charging that replaces the federal, driving most of the proceeds from that to folks who cannot currently and have not historically been able to afford health care, overwhelmingly in communities of color uh, that now can. Um, it's, a, it's a meltdown. Um, the state subsidy, I assume you mean the HIA subsidy I just referred to, that's a law. So I've signed that in a law. So that lasts unless Matt tells me otherwise. That's not an executive order. That's going to last forever and for always. Uh, and that's uh, not, not a coincidence. We needed that. Vote by mail, I believe it's over a million so far that we just announced uh, last night. And so far it's going really well. Uh, five of the six Murphys are able to vote. We went out Friday night dropped our Sam who could not vote held the flap of the secure box open and the five of us dropped our ballots in the box um, I think it's going really well uh, as we expected again folks you all got a ballot you have four choices mail it in and we'll stay on the postal service to make sure that it's dealt with expeditiously if you don't like that as we did drop it in a box we've got almost 300 of them around the state if you don't like that, show up on election day, hand your ballot to a poll worker. Or if you don't like that, you can vote in person. Seems to me that covers all bases. It balances public health with the sacred right at the core of democracy to vote. Listen, if folks are frustrated by motor vehicles, I don't blame them, and so am I, period. Um, but having said that, in this case, to your question, we got to follow public health guidelines. Uh, and remember, while there are lots of noise, and there should be, by the way, around people being outside, a big part of that reason is that inside looks completely differently than it used to. Uh, all the health protocols are being observed, social distancing, uh, partitions, face coverings, etc. That's forced more people outside. I would just say this. We can't avoid the public health responsibilities, and that includes their playbook to shut places down if they've had COVID positive. Um, secondly, if you're frustrated, I don't blame you. I am too. So is Sue Fulton and her team. They're doing everything they can. Uh, they're chopping through this as best they can. Thirdly, you can go online and do a lot of business that you don't need to show up for to do in person. And what you can do online, that list is going to grow. So watch that space. Fourthly, please don't camp out overnight. You don't need to. There's no reason to do that. Show up when they open, get your number, get your appointment time, leave and then come back for that appointment time. But again, I know people are, even if you do all that, it isn't perfect. I get that. Uh, and we won't rest until it gets perfect. So thank you. Sir, you, got, you feel like you got one or two here. I can just feel it. Uh, regarding the Lakewood Public Schools, since reopening, there have been 27 positive cases in the district, 16 staff and 11 students. Based on the guidelines by the DOH, it seems it would be necessary to close the schools for two weeks, but they remain open. Is there any chance you would consider closing schools in this region like they did in New York? Thank you. I mean, I, uh, I'm taking your numbers uh, for, uh, on, on their surface. I actually don't have that number in front of me, that it's a total of 27. We did say there were three incidents or outbreaks of in-school transmission in Ocean County. Um, I won't speak specifically to the Lakewood schools because there's a protocol and Judy's 
That's a decision that the local health authorities, in addition to the local leadership of the school district, um, are primar have primary responsibility for. But it's pretty clear what the playbook needs to look like in order to take certain steps. And Judy, I've still got my, my grid, if this, then that. Um, so it depends on, you know, again, it will depend. Again, I'm not specific to Lakewood. It depends, was it in the same classroom? Were the cases connected? Uh, or were they in different buildings, different rooms, different wings unconnected uh, or disconnected? So it, it matters in terms of not just the numbers of cases, but the, the, the specific uh, reality of them. Anything you want to add to that? Are you, you okay? Okay. Thank you for that. Elise, nice to see you. Good afternoon. Two questions. The New Jersey jobs report today showed an, abu an abrupt drop in unemployment but also in labor force participation. What's behind the latter? Are people no longer looking for work? Also, Brent reported yesterday that New Jersey has reached its own bar for self-quarantining. Is the state, along with New York and Connecticut, planning to raise that bar? Thank you. Thanks, Elise. Um, uh, on the second one, I've got no uh, firsthand knowledge of uh, raising the bar. Judy, Judy May, because she's in touch with her health counter, counterparts. But I would also reiterate the point that I made earlier. We're already on uh, other states' lists. Uh, our job is to not complain about being on those lists, but to do everything we can to break the back of the numbers and get it into shape. And that's what we'll continue to focus on. And secondly, I think there's a big flashing sign here. Uh, this is not a good time to travel. Uh, you got to travel only if you have to. And I think your first question, Elise, are you okay with that, Judy and Tina, in terms of um, anything you want to add there? And then your first uh, question, I believe, is any color as to the, folk, the fact that, that put aside what the numerator looks like, uh, the denominator, people have just said thrown in the towel uh, and left the workforce. Um, I don't have any color on that, but I'm not shocked by it. Um, these are desperate times for a whole lot of families, a whole lot of workers in our state and in our country. Um, and I, I can't speak to every case clearly, but you've probably got people who are kind of throwing the towel in and giving up that there's any realistic near-term um, change of course that's available to them. And I think that's awful. Uh, and, and, and I've already gone through the data in our state and what we're doing with the FEMA extra top-up piece, but we desperately need Congress to pass a big, robust, sufficiently robust, I might add, uh, bill that is signed by the president that gets to the needs that are the highest right now in our country and folks who are unemployed are at the top of the list. Small businesses, restaurants, states, local municipalities, counties, uh, to keep people employed, to keep them delivering the services. We've got to give people a reason to believe. We've got to give them hope. We'll do everything we can in our state. We have and will continue to, uh, but we can't do it all. No state can. We need the federal government to come in uh, and, and, and come in not just in a modest way and not just at some point, but come in in a big way and come in now. Matt, anything you want to add to that? Are you... Again, Matt, thank you for your service. Uh, say that publicly again. Uh, I'll mask up here. Judy, Tina, thank you. Likewise, we'll be in touch, as we all know, but we'll see you, if not before, on Monday. Joe, thank you for your leadership. You've had loss uh, during this uh, period, so you continue to be in our prayers. God bless you, pal. Pat, thank you for everything you're doing. Jared, Mahan, the rest of the team, again, will be virtual with you unless we think otherwise it's warranted tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll be with you again back to that Monday, Thursday rhythm next week. And again, folks, thank you overwhelmingly for everything you have done and continue to do. And I think if we had one theme, Judy and Tina and Pat, uh, one theme today is don't assume when you walk through the door to your home or to your friends or when you're just in a non-regulated, non-enforceable environment that you can let your hair down because you can't. We all have to acknowledge that, and that's particularly with Thanksgiving coming up, with Hanukkah, Christmas, other holidays. Um, we have to approach these holidays, approach our living reality in a, way, in a way that's different than the past, 
And by the way, if we do it, it's a down payment on our ability to get back to the good old days sooner than later. So sacrifices we might make this Thanksgiving allow us to be that much stronger and much more normal next Thanksgiving, by example. Thank you again to everybody. God bless you all.